welcome to Depth Insights, where we take a psychological look at news and events that are going on in your world. I'm Bonnie Bright. My guest for the show today is Les Lancaster, who is a researcher and scholar in transpersonal psychology. And Les's interest in consciousness, spirituality, and transpersonal psychology have led him to his current life's work as the founding director of Aleph Trust, which is a UK-based educational organization that offers postgraduate programs as well as open learning courses in consciousness, spirituality, and transpersonal psychology. So we're going to dig into the whole topic of transpersonal psychology today and compare it and contrast it with depth psychology, among other things. Meanwhile, Les, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. You're welcome. Well, I'm so happy to have you here because I think that transpersonal psychology was probably, for me, the precursor to depth psychology. I sort of discovered both of them right around the same time, and they both had a really tremendous impact on my own life personally. I can go more into the story, I guess, as we have our conversation, but I experienced a pretty profound awakening that was really of a transpersonal nature, and that led me to Stan Groff's work, which led me into holotropic breathwork and transpersonal psychology in general. Some of these terms may not be as familiar to our listeners, but we are going to break them down and we will get into that momentarily. But first, Les, I'm going to read your bio so that everybody has more background on you. Okay. Brian Les Lancaster is a founding director and currently academic dean of Olive Trust. He is also Professor Emeritus of Transpersonal Psychology at Liverpool John Moores University in the UK and Associated Distinguished Professor of Integral and Transpersonal Psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies in the US, and also known as CIIS, and an Honorary Research Fellow in the Center for Jewish Studies at Manchester University. He's currently a board member of the Association for Transpersonal Psychology and has previously been chair of the Transpersonal Psychology section of the British Psychological Society and president of the International Transpersonal Association. Les is co-founder and co-director of Sacred Science Circle. So Les, there's a lot in your bio there. Obviously, you have made quite a career of transpersonal psychology. Maybe we should start there and just discuss a little bit about what transpersonal psychology is for those who may not know at all or who may have some inkling of it but aren't quite sure. And then I'd like to really have us look together at what the differences are between transpersonal psychology and depth psychology. Okay, that's a, a great place to start. <laughs> uh, transpersonal psychology. Well, I didn't start my career as a transpersonal psychologist. I think I should say that initially. Um, my background's in neuroscience, cognitive science. Uh, but throughout my adult life, I've been fascinated by issues of spirituality and mysticism especially mysticism. And you know, what brings it all together is the mind, you know, understanding the depths of the mind. So transpersonal psychology, well, let's use the word transpersonal. There's a sphere of our lives which revolves the personality, who I am, what we'll call the ego. I'm sure everyone listening knows what we mean by ego. And what we learn from many areas, mysticism and spirituality amongst them, but also depth psychology, and what we learn is that the ego is only one small part of ourselves. So transpersonal psychology is interested in what goes beyond that small part of ourselves. And I guess it, there's a theoretical side to that, you know, understanding one of my areas of interest is the nature of consciousness. You know, so what is it about consciousness that goes beyond the immediate sense of the ego and and in an applied sense you know how how do we assist people in making these journeys which go beyond the that immediate sense of the personality to explore the farther reaches the you know the deeper nature of mind and the world of which we're a part you know so I would say that that's, you know, transpersonal psychology is the psychology that acknowledges that there is so much more than is there in the immediacy of our sort of ego-based consciousness. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And of course, for me, I really imagine a lot of people who have been following depth psychology 
specifically for a long time, will assume that there is a lot of overlap between the two fields because, of course, Jung is also considered one of the pioneers of transpersonal psychology. At least he is one of the major contributors to some of the theories of it. And also, of course, his collective unconscious, the ideas and notions of how that collective unconscious is repository for so many of these things that we don't know is you talk about all these things that are beyond our ego, but we don't even, we can't even fathom what the, you know, the great mystery of, of many of those things are. Of course, they come up to consciousness in various different ways. And one thing that I do like about transpersonal psychology is it seems to have a real initiative to find and utilize some of these tools and vehicles to actually gain access to that unknown or the, the unconscious parts of ourselves and our psyches and the world and the universe. Yeah, yeah. And you, you mentioned you Sandra Sandra before, before. Uh, so, so a great example of someone who developed tools to, to approach, you know, to, so it, when he started he was using psychedelic uh, drugs uh, and then he developed ways to use a special approach to breathing, you know, deep um, holotropic breath work. Uh, heightened breath work and, and and a lot of music and sound and so on. This, so these are techniques. I mean, there are many techniques over the centuries. We can go back to you know the shamanic origins of so much you know so much of the the early human societies. Um, drumming techniques, yeah, and especially using the breath. Um, the you know practices of meditation, practices using a sense of the divine, how the, that is understood. But if we're talking about the early ages, you know, a sense of the divine that is infusing everything within us, outside of us, and that the breath is that which unifies, brings together what's beyond us and what's within us. So practices that really focus into the breath. So there are many ways over the ages that humans have explored that which is beyond the immediate aspect of mind so so over many centuries you know there are many practices uh, i mentioned earlier stan groff and you know he, he's developed 20th 21st century approaches but uh, these are all based on on ideas that are part of our common heritage so yes i mean what you're saying the transpersonal psychology it shares a great deal with depth psychology but i think maybe transpersonal psychology has become more fluid in its approach to adopting practices, um, you know, which have a longer history in terms of spiritual practices. Obviously, depth psychology has its own practices, but they 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 tend. And we have Freud and the you know, free association approach that he used, uh, hypnosis and other technique that's used, and Jung. You mentioned Jung. Jung is a huge pioneer. There's no question about that. And his his approach to active imagination, really trying to amplify the imagery. You know, the centre of the psyche is about imagery, and Jung understood that so well. And you know, his his life work really was was finding ways to amplify that imagery to let us to enable us to to connect with that fount of the imagination that is really the core of what it is to be human. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, Jung obviously was such a huge contributor to so much of the theory and the ideas around consciousness, but also he was willing to adopt some of the teachings and ancient teachings of that from Eastern practices and mysticism, obviously. But I think that he was in fact somewhat limited because at least in the beginning of his career and, and throughout you know, several decades of it, he was trying so hard, I think, to be the scientist and to make sure that psychology, the budding force that it was, would be kind of fitting within a certain set of rules, I guess you could say. And I'm, you know, I, I don't know to what extent we can really say that he succeeded at that, because obviously the more of these mystical experiences that he had, and his Red Book being a good example of that, I think the more he was willing to say that, you know, it can't all be defined by science, and he was more willing to allow a little bit of those pretty strict boundaries that he had set around depth psychology at the time, but I'm wondering if you can say something about the scientific aspects of transpersonal psychology and how that is viewed currently. Yeah, and again, you put your finger on something very important here. Psychology is a scientific discipline. 
there's an interesting balance between the extent to which we are conditioned by our culture, the time we live in, and sometimes when individuals, maybe rare individuals, can break through a little bit perhaps, a bit more, you know, to, we talk about paradigm shifts, yeah, to, to go beyond that limiting time and place. Jung is one of those individuals, but, you know, he, exactly what you said, he was constrained. He wanted to come across as a scientist, and it was a challenge to him for most of his career, actually. You're right. In the, la the last years of his life, I think he felt more freedom in that way. But let's not talk about Jung, because we're speculating a little bit, but I'll, I'll answer your question to talk about transpersonal psychology. But I mention that because I think it's a crucial point. You know, the, the, the science itself is changing. And, you know, there are huge movements, really big movements today, towards what we're calling post-materialistic science. And, you know, that's a whole subject in its own right. What is science? Science is a way of pursuing knowledge. Now, of course, there are many ways of pursuing knowledge. Science is a particular way which uses a certain set of rules around experimentation. But in some ways, we've almost come to the limits of that, where that has led us. You know, all the great advances in science in the 20th century, for example, they're, they're, you know, they're about experimental work to confirm hypotheses, etc. But when you look at the leading edge of, let's say, physics, which is probably, you know, the queen of the sciences, today, relying on experimental verification is not always possible. You know, and I think that's true in psychology as well. There's a huge amount. I mean, psychology is... A scientific discipline over the 20th and early part of the 21st century. You know, so much has been discovered through scientific psychology. But the areas that we're interested in, that we're talking about here, it's not always possible to, to put it onto a short scientific footing. And I mean, an area that you know I spent most of my career exploring and writing about is that of consciousness. So there's a good place to start. You know, uh, many would suggest that consciousness is a product of, let's say, the human brain. Maybe some other animals are conscious, I don't know. It's, it's a product of the physical processing of the brain. That seems to be kind of uh, a faith backdrop for so many, for example, many neuroscientists interested in consciousness. But it's just that. It's a faith. And we have no no solid evidence to say that consciousness is nothing other than the product of the physical processes in the brain. Uh, you know, and I, my background is neuroscience. I, I, you know, I know all this research. The fact is that I, I sign up to a post-materialistic view of science. I think the consciousness, which is right at the core of these questions, um, is something that we are never going to understand fully if we restrict our lens to a lens of physicalism. So I would say that there is something about, about consciousness which is intrinsic to the whole cosmos. It's not solely a product of the human brain. The human brain maybe is the most exquisite focuser of consciousness in many ways. So we are conscious and we are conscious in particular kinds of ways. And, and we can look at all that in scientific ways. We can focus into the brain and which parts are doing what and the processes and so on. But the real question that is tucked in there which is about the essential nature of consciousness science as we know it today is not going to answer that question so when you ask me about transpersonal psychology and how it relates to science there, there, there are so many strands within transpersonal psychology but i think the bottom line and the, and the point that i would make in answer to your question is that we transpersonal psychologists a part of a movement to extend our paths to knowledge. And so we're not constrained by what I would say is an outmoded vision of science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, what you're bringing up is really important here because I think that a lot of people probably have this idea that transpersonal psychology particularly and some other kinds of psychologies, including depth psychology, are 
are really quite highly based on the idea of spirituality, that there is not necessarily so much of the brain science behind it. But in fact, actually transpersonal psychology really started to come into being in the 60s when we began to have also a movement in, in the capacity for us to measure the brain through new kinds of tools and that sort of thing too. So can you say a little bit more though about spirituality and transpersonal psychology? You've talked about the consciousness aspect of it, but we also know that transpersonal psychology, one of its aims is to really explore these so-called mystical experiences that you had mentioned earlier. So I'm wondering if you can say something about that. Yeah. And, and the first thing I say just on the last bit you said there, because I think it's important to explore mystical experience, but also to distill what is valuable. And, you know, often there are aspects which are not valuable. And how do we make those differentiations? And, you know, I think the goal of transpersonal psychology, one of them, is to refine our understanding in order to enable people to, to reach these higher states however we understand that and to do them in it's to do that in ways that are safe and wise but you ask about spirituality of course this again is about culture it's about society it's about the time and you know the age we live in the word spirituality was hardly used going back 50 years um you know so the fact that this term is so strong in our culture today it, it says something about the direction we as a culture are taking. Uh, you know, it's not just a word. It, it's a way of envisioning things, right? So spirituality is understood as being different from religion, for example. Religion today, you know, the word religion, yes, that was there 50 years ago. That, you know, there's a whole history there. So what's changed is shift between the sort of institutional structures of religion being to the fore, a shift from that to the more inner inner experience being central. And we understand that by the term spirituality. It's very difficult to define spirituality. I mean, many people have written many, many words on that. But, you know, I think a core aspect of spirituality, and I say this because then I can link into what I mean by transpersonal, a core aspect of spirituality is the sense of meaning, and the sense of being connected to something larger than oneself. So transpersonal psychology takes that as its foundation. You said that you know, it, it's, it has its origins in the 60s. You know, we're, 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 at the moment, we're celebrating the 50th, the jubilee of transpersonal psychology. Um, and yeah, that was a time, the 60s, early 70s, a time of great exploration, exploration of the mind. Very interesting period in terms of you know, cultural evolution. So, so transpersonal psychology, I would say is the branch of psychology that is not constrained by trying to put everything into a sort of physical or materialistic framework. Um, you know, you mentioned before that, that that maybe goes for depth psychology as well. But in some ways, it's not such an easy division to make. The term death psychology itself is, is quite difficult. I mean, it was first introduced by Bloiler, you know, working with Freud. And, and, and you know, Freud liked that term, although he went for psychoanalysis. But he liked the term death psychology. But, you know, he didn't include spirituality as part of the framework that he was exploring. Although, again, that, that's another story. There are some interesting aspects about that that, that would take us too far on a tangent. But, you know, so the term death psychology covers such a broad area. And, again, it has changed over time. So I think when you say about spirituality being within death psychology, that wasn't always the case. But because of the changes in our culture and society that I referred to, so I think now many, many people associated with death psychology recognize the importance of the spirit and how to cultivate the work of the spirit. But again, another point to say on that, when we talk, I said spirituality is about connecting with something larger than ourselves. Larger than what? Larger than the ego. Okay, so we can say, well, there's something more than the ego in the psyche, the self, for example, the way Jung talks about that. So spirituality is about connecting with the self. But so, so many aspects of 
the older ways of viewing this have significant ontological implications. In other words, it's a question of how we view reality. Uh, and this relates to what before, what I said before about science and materialism. So, you know, I would say that you are not going to fully engage with the work of the spirit or the soul, the phrase I used before, you are not going to fully engage like that without embracing something beyond a materialistic ontology. So, and this is a struggle between transpersonal psychology and many other branches of psychology. Yes. But I think, you know, that if we can't recognize that there is something more to our world than, than the purely physical, then it's as if we're trying to do transpersonal psychology with one hand tied behind our backs. Right, yeah. Yeah, and I think that, uh, I mean, just to close on Jung, because obviously he's, he's somebody that has been very inspirational for me, and I have a long history myself in depth psychology, but, but for me, I'm trying to figure out how to hold that balance between the two and to really begin to understand what each one offers that is unique, and again, of course, where they overlap. So I think this idea of spirituality and being related to something larger is really at the core of both of them, and I very much appreciate that, because there, there is a quote by Jung which I really love. And he says, is, is man related to something infinite or not? That is the telling question of his life. And of course, that does carry down to this. I'm, I'm thinking maybe as I hear you talk that part of the difference, and I think you alluded to that actually, is that the time frame or the time period within which each of these two started. So you had talked about how the 60s were such a, a time of transition um, worldwide, really, but particularly, of course, we know in the US and, and also in Europe to, to a great extent. And when Jung began and Freud, they were back at the turn of the 20th century when it first began to you know it was they had their roots more in the Victorian and and definitely a different mindset and even a different culture whereas in the US where transpersonal psychology really was yeah. safe, it was a it was a completely different culture can you say something more for our viewers and listeners about the history of how transpersonal psychology came together and it can be brief but I'd like to just make sure that everybody has an understanding of that well, I think the first point to make is what you just said, that, that it's very much an Amer American, you know, started in the US. And that's very interesting in itself, I think, because, you know, when we compare it with, with depth psychology talking about Jung and Freud, these, you know, these are products of the, of the Western, the European mind. And um, uh, again, it's probably too big a subject to go into, but many aspects of what, what, you know, what Freud and Jung were bringing out have their antecedents in European history. Um, recent European history, but also going way back, way, way back into you know, the formative aspects of European philosophical tradition and so on. And you know, the American tradition is different. And transversal psychology, I think, owes a lot to the Walt Whitman, uh, the transcendentalists, as it were, uh, which, and I think the American tradition was a much freer tradition. It's interesting, you know, I talked about culture before, another huge aspect in the sort of condition of culture is geography. You know, America is huge, Europe is very small, and historically all these little places in fighting and so on. You know, and it's not that, that America didn't have its battles, but geographically, it's a very expansive kind of environment. And so I think it, it was the American consciousness that was there at the onset of transpersonal psychology. So the founders of transpersonal psychology, people like you know, Abraham Maslow or um, Sutich and Stan Groff himself, we talked about, now they, they were connected with psychology. So they were part of the framework of psychology, academic psychology, and also the applied, the healing, the counseling, psychotherapeutic side as well. They're, you know, the humanistics, another term to bring in there. So they were part of the overarching framework of, of academic psychology and its constraints. And, and you know, that, so there was this tension. There was this kind of constraining jacket from the, you know, the academic world uh, and then 
particularly in the 60s, there was this huge opening up, huge vistas. Yes, a lot to do with psychedelics, a very important factor in that. But it wasn't just that, it was rediscovering or discovering for the first time, you know, the the uh, more esoteric, the more mystical, uh, you know, Eastern influences coming in. So it was a hot, it was a real melting pot, and yeah, and, and I think that's always been the case. I mean, again, we could talk historically about this. You know, the the crucial thing for Jung was discovering alchemy, and alchemy was very strongly influenced by the, the the Kabbalistic tradition. You know, later in his life, Jung, you quoted Jung before, one thing that he said was that almost the, the entire gamut of his psychology was anticipated by uh, an 18th century rabbi, a Kabbalist. You know? uh, Jung came to that later in his life, realizing that, you know, so many of the, these ideas, and the whole idea of the unconscious, you know, we find in, in the Kabbalistic tradition, we find it in Buddhist thinking, going, going you know, way back. So, you know, what happened in the States in the 60s and the 70s was this amazing integration. It wasn't finally integrated, but it was, you know, the process started of exploring the mind, you know, meditation was coming on stream um recognition of jung was a huge you know, again huge important factor there so there's this dare i mention the music as well sitting here as i sit in in merseyside our famous four boys who uh, shook the world you know i mean it's all part of the, it was part of that and so there was a, a desire a kind of a, a will to advanced psychology in a way that it could relate to these issues because the core of all these things the eastern influences you know the psychedelic and the spiritual side the, what brings them all together is understanding the human mind sure. or even the mind of god if you want to get a bit more poetical yeah. and so it is psychology and the, the re, you know the real question in there is about psychology rediscovering its own soul and these guys, you know, Stan Groff, Dave Maslow, etc. That's, I think, their, you know, when we look back and we say, well, what was their, what, you know, what goes on their tombstone or whatever it is. I think that's it. It's about rediscovering the soul of psychology. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. I really like that. I hadn't thought about that before, but it strikes me in a, in a very important way, I think, in this moment. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about the exploration of the, the mystery of, linking spirituality, the history of transpersonal psychology. Can you circle back around now and maybe say something about how all of this can be applied in everyday life? And through that, maybe a mention of some of the research that is coming out of transpersonal psychology. Sure. Um, well, maybe a place to start is, is what some call the mindfulness revolution right um you know you say how's it applied in our lives uh, there's been such a shift i mean this goes back to what i was saying before about the cultural change and so on uh, everywhere we look in our culture our western culture at the moment you, you see things about meditation or mindfulness so you now this has come this shift has come about on the back of what the pioneers of transversal psychology were trying to do yeah so you know, if we go back to the, the, the middle of the 20th century, no one, no one would put their head above the parapet in psychology and talk about meditation. Yeah? Um, and that shifted because of the rise of transpersonal psychology. So, you know, when you say about the applications, um, I mean, you know, everything in life, <laughs> it's like where isn't there an application the core of our lives is the way we find meaning you know our own narrative our stories you know life is a journey and we create the journeys and find our meaning why we're here what our aspirations are so you know the, the, there's nothing more applied than that that's the core of everything right so the question is what feeds into those narratives and the fact is that it's such a different world today. So, you know, for for huge numbers of people in, in, in especially Western society, I mean, it's different in the East because they've got their, you know, they've got a different history and things are changing as well out East. Uh, and there's a, you know, globalization is a huge thing here. So in terms of the applications, anywhere where we're trying to enrich people's life's journey, 
then I think transpersonal psychology is there. It may not be there in name. You know, this is another interesting point. The term transpersonal psychology is not always received well. And you know, that's a question, why would that be? But, you know, what I would say is transpersonal psychology is psychology, to use the image again used before, without the hand tied behind the back, right? So we can openly bring uh, spiritual, mystical, religious ideas into our dialogues. And that becomes applied. There's no question. This is, you know, many people, whether they call themselves religious or more these days, will say that spirituality is a major value in their lives. So the work that we're doing, when you talked about research, you know, research in meditation, that was a huge area, I mentioned that. Um, research, on some of my own work, looking at Buddhist literature and how the, the insights into the nature of mind that we find in you know, ancient Buddhist texts can enrich our neuropsychological understanding of of consciousness and that has implications not only in terms of well-being and you know the sense of flourishing in our daily lives but also in relation to some of the limitations it is like I don't know autism or, or different you know different neurological conditions where we're trying to maximize the value in people's lives in what are often very challenging circumstances so uh, areas like um, you know hospice you know areas of dying how we enable people to die with dignity i think that's another area where the shift towards spirituality and a recognition for example of near-death experience these are ways in which this is becoming very applied I mentioned that one, near-death experience, that's an area that transpersonal psychologists have researched in, in considerable depth, you know, and there are still challenging questions. Is it is a near-death experience just a product of the physical brain? Is it something larger? Is the person connecting with the mind outside of themselves? Is it about the soul journey? Uh, many questions, but the fact is, however you address those questions, the notion of that kind of unusual experience is clearly on the agenda today. So it's kind of a you know, transpersonal psychology has legitimized so much of these aspects of experience which don't easily fit into the packages of a sort of materialistic framework. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And of course, all you have to do is take one look at the LF Trust website and see the sort of courses that you're offering there to get a really good overview of some of those aspects that we delve into from a transpersonal standpoint that maybe have not been as open, you know, in, in the long past. Of course, the, uh, with the advent of transpersonal psychology, all of these began to open up in new and different ways for those of us who are kind of more mainstream or everyday sort of people who maybe have those spiritual leanings but haven't really identified them or haven't identified what to do with them in light of the fact that religion is kind of largely disappearing or, or changing quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I, I was just looking at some of those courses and I see things like creativity and transformation, Kabbalistic psychology, shamanistic psychology, transpersonal dreaming, meditation and mindfulness, transpersonal eco-psychology, approaches to consciousness, transformational leadership, <laughs> transpersonal coaching psychology. I could go on and on. And of course, Aleph also offers now master's and doctorate degrees in transpersonal psychology, consciousness, and spirituality. Can you just say a few words as we wrap up here, how you actually ended up with Aleph Trust and how that came about? What was your what was your guiding force? There? Oh, m most of my career, I was at uh, a UK university, Liverpool John Moores University. Yet, as I said before, originally that I was there as a neuroscientist, um, and you know, over many years, I mean, I'm talking forty years here, the challenge to bring what was initially a kind of side interest. My interest in mysticism, in, in meditation, and so on. You know, um, 50 years ago, I couldn't bring those into mainstream psychology. But 
though the, you know, they were crucially important to me, my own development, my interests, and so on. So I think the challenge of my career, I think many, many in transversal psychology, I'd say is the same. The challenge has been to actually bring what you're really interested in into psychology. And, and it was a long journey, long time. So I was fortunate to be able to, in John Moore's university, I was fortunate some 20 years ago, I set up courses, postgraduate master's courses in consciousness and transversal psychology. Um, one of my colleagues there, Michael Daniels, we worked together to, to make this happen. And it was, it was kind of revolutionary within academic psychology. So we, you know, we, we were part of the revolution in that way. After 10, 15 years of that, I, I wanted to be even more radical. <laughs> and, and, you know, the university world has its own constraints. Um, and so I felt this was like 10 years ago that I wanted to build something outside of that university and join forces with Jessica Bockler. She's one of the founding directors with me. And she brings not only this interest in transversal psychology, but also working in, in the health sector and well-being. So it's bringing together the, you know, the, the academic, the scholarly aspects, but also a range of applications, how you can apply this stuff. It's the question you asked before. You know, so the Isle of Trust, we, we, we set up the Isle of Trust, a non-profit company, to give us that freedom to do, yes, we can do the academic stuff, and we are in partnership with Liverpool John Moores University to offer these academic awards, as you say, masters, PhD, um, to do that, but also to have this other side, the, the, the applications, both in terms of you know, working within the health sector, but also in terms of working with groups of individuals that are trying to enrich their lives, you know. I mean, that's my area application. I've worked, you know, I've worked with, with groups using ritual practices, using breath work, using imagination, you know, to, to find new ways of being. And uh, so the Isle of Trust, that's its mission. You know, its mission is is to bring this balance, try and strike this balance. Because, you know, there's a lot of interest in spirituality, etc., but some of it goes a little bit, what's the word, a bit wacky in the sense that, you know, it may be exciting and interesting, but it loses some of the grounding in good scholarship. So we say, okay, well, the art of trust is we recognize the importance of exploration, you know, of that uh, the shamanistic journeying. You mentioned we've got a course on shamanistic psychology. We recognize that, but we say it's got to be grounded in the other strength of the human mind, which is reason. And that's the scholarly, the academic, the scientific, recognizing what I said before, that, you know, not science is a straitjacket, but recognizing that science actually is going through something of a revolution itself now. So the Isle of Trust really is, is there. It's, I like to think it's at the leading edge of these changes. Yeah, well, it certainly feels like it's the culmination of so many of these threads that we've been talking about and also your own career. It's just all come together into one place where people can now look for self-transformation or a degree in self-transformation, essentially, if, if that's what they're looking for. So it's really an amazing accomplishment on your part and so I really congratulate you. I know you've been around for a few years now and continuing to grow and also just so appreciative less of your time today to talk about transpersonal psychology. Your passion for the topic is clear and your knowledge and your background obviously have contributed in so great part and so I really am grateful for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. Bonnie I enjoyed it very much. It's lovely talking with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And so again, I've been talking with Les Lancaster, who is a researcher, a scholar, and also the founding director of Olive Trust. And you can find out more about Olive Trust at their website, which is olivetrust.org. And it's spelled A-L-E-F-T-R-U-S-T.org. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.